Hey, good evening, Facebook family. Good evening, Facebook family. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. It's not even 7 o'clock yet. Uh, it's not quite 7 o'clock yet, so we're just going to wait till 7 o'clock, get on around here so we can get into this evening's discussion. Good evening, Brother Lee. Good evening, Brother Lee. Got some more people on here, I think. Good to see you. Got a few minutes here before we get started. I started to log on early. Try to make sure everything is working right. I trust that your week has been blessed so far. Wednesday, up day, middle of the week. Good evening, Sister Duana. So good to see you. Still got a couple of minutes before we get started. Got anybody on conference call yet? Still got a couple of minutes, but while you while you uh, while you're waiting, you can go ahead and get uh, get your Bibles to Ephesians chapter two. That's where we'll be launching from. Uh, Ephesians chapter two. That's where we'll be taking off from. Let's go ahead and see. Can we get your Bibles over to Ephesians chapter 2? Uh, it's just Wednesday, but it seems like Thursday or Friday. <laughs> it's like it's been a pretty long week for me anyway. Almost 6.59, 6.59. We're going to go ahead and get this party started. We're going to get this party started because we're in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Can everybody hear me okay? Lee, Duana, can you guys hear me? Can all of you hear me so far? Just type, just hit thumbs up or yes or... Yeah, thumbs up. Let me know you can hear me. Conference call family, can y'all hear me? Okay. Okay. All right. In Ephesians chapter 2. Good evening. And, all right, thanks, Lee. Want to make sure everybody can hear me. Okay, okay. All right, Ben. So glad to have you join us. Well, it's 7 o'clock, so we want to go ahead and uh, I hope you already have your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, that's where we're going tonight. We're going to look at some of, the, some of the imagery that Paul is using as he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. It's pretty interesting. I'm kind of glad the author took this direction, gives us some things to look at and talk about. I'm going to be slow and deliberate in my class tonight because I want you... 
to be able to type in some responses on my conference call. I want you to be able to just, uh, uh, good evening, Antoinette. I want you to be able to um, speak out and speak up to some things. It's just interesting to hear the thought pattern of how we read God's word. So we're going to be kind of slow and deliberate, especially with the first question we're going to be dealing with on page 20 in our book. Uh, page 20 in our book. All right, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. We'll have a word of prayer, and we're going to we're going to go ahead and get this class started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for just blessing us for being so good to us. We thank you for keeping us, O oh Lord, and bringing us into this day. Uh, we thank you for protecting us, guiding us, caring for us. Thank you for our health, our mind, our body, our strength the wherewithal, our spirit that dwells within us, not only the spirit that is our life, but the Holy Spirit, which brings life. We thank you for all of that, Father God. Please be with us this hour as we venture back into the conversation that Paul is having with the church of Ephesus. May we glean from it that which will help us to be strengthened in our walk with you this day. And thank you for Jesus to Christ, our Lord and our Savior. In his name we pray, amen. All right, let's look at this thing here. Uh, the author's having us reading verses 11 through 22 in Ephesians chapter 2. 11 through 22, that's what the author has suggested for us to read today uh, because he wants us to, uh, he wants us to look at some of the things that Paul is sharing with uh, the church at Ephesus. And, uh, in verse number 11, Paul says, remember that you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision. Uh, I like when Paul uses that conversation there because he says, remember formerly the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised. You know, those are the ones that didn't have the, uh, the covenant of circumcision. He said, you were called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcised, because it seems as if the Jews, even though they were circumcised, they were not honoring the covenant of faith and obedience that accompanied the circumcision. You know what that sounds like today in modern terminology? What that conversation would sound like today would read something like, remember those of you who used to be in the world and how you were called worldly by the so-called removed from the world. And the baptized people, how they might look at unbaptized people acting like they're uh, saved, but really they're not even honoring the covenant that accompanies the baptism or the rebirth that takes place with the baptism and the Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying they're called the so-called circumcision because even though they have been circumcised in the flesh, they are not honoring the promise and the faith that accompanies the circumcision. The God had Abraham in the beginning the prom the uh, the act of the circumcision, the covenant of the circumcised. It also was along with the promise gave Abraham, which God gave Abraham. And Bible says, and because Abraham believed God, and God called him. God counted his righteousness and he became known by, to us as the father of faith. But it was because of Abraham's belief in God that accompanied the circumcision and the act itself. So Paul here now says, remember Gentiles, you used to be called the uncircumcised by those who are the so-called circumcised. But he says, it's performed in the flesh, flesh by human hands. That's instrumental too. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant and promises, having no hope and without God in the world. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, 
we're now beginning at verse number 13. So we are in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at, that's where we are right now. So he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having it put to death the enmity. I'm going to stop just right there because it's a little bit more reading, but that's enough for all of us right now. So Paul uses a lot of imagery in this text. And, and all of you, because I know you already have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 2, and this is the kind of patience I'm going to exhibit this evening. Uh, I want you to go ahead, if you're on a conference call, I, I want you to share with me one of the imagery that you see Paul using in this text. And if you're on Facebook, you can just go ahead and type in one, just one use of imagery in this text. I'm going to read off for, for, because there are some more. And might reconcile them both, verse 16, in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Look at verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is proving into a whole, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So I asked you all, if you're on this Facebook, Paul uses a lot of imagery in this text. What are one of the images that you see in this text? Conference call people, what are one of the images that you see in this text? Y'all know I always say I, I, I wish I had a Bible reader because the class is not about me. It's about your reading. And y'all, everybody knows me in the book of Ephesians. So what are one of the images that you see Paul uses uh, in this particular text that we're looking at right now? Anybody write something, say something. It's not a difficult question. You have a Bible in front of you, right? See, so you have no idea I was going to ask you questions tonight that pertain to your Bible. Oh, so hold on, Ben. Ben. Ben, hold on for me. You said strangers. Okay, so one of the images Paul uses is, is he calls them strangers. He said, You are no longer strangers. So that's one of the images that Paul uses. Strangers. What'd you say, LaCroix? And he, use, and he says aliens. He does use them both. So my conference call people are, are, are in the class. I don't know what my Facebook friends are doing. They haven't typed anything. They're probably trying to read it right now real quick. <laughs> uh, well, he doesn't use a marriage. Imagery is a word spoken that immediately paints an, a, a picture or an object, something that you can see in the uh, corridors of your mind. If I say the word apple, whether you like apples or not, you're going to see an apple in your mind. That's an image. You're going to see red or green apple or yellow apples, you, but you will see an apple. If I say the door was locked, you will automatically, by the picture in your mind, see a door because that's the image that I projected into your cognizant or your ability to understand and comprehend. That's the image that I set forth. 
So when Paul uses image here or imagery, uh, friends, uh, my conference call people have said that he uses strangers and aliens. There's there's a lot of it's a lot of imagery in here. The, the, the ideal of being a far off, what pictures does that paint? A far off, what, what, what image does that give? Yeah, he says, you who were far off, the image painted there, the ideal there is, the ideal there is a far off, they could see kind of like the man in the uh, the rich man in Lazarus. He said, and he looked across the gulf afar uh, off, but he still could see Lazarus. The imagery of they all became one. So if the image of they all became one, what do we what kind of picture is that painting? Uh two, and it's, and it almost ties into what Dwayne says. Um but not necessarily a marriage distant yes michelle without hope that's that's the state they were in but tell me how he got to the let me help you guys just a little bit so we can be get to the same place if you go back to the verse number 11 the the verse yes that's the that's the condition they were in but we're talking about imagery in other words he paul uses a lot of images yes the truth was they were not no hope and the truth were they were not close to christ but what's the image the image that would go with not being close to christ would be the far off and it was not being close to god is what paul is talking about here because christ is the unifier Something not attained, but look, let's look at verse 11. Remember, you once were called uncircumcised. What's the image used for what, what, what brings to mind when you think about uncircumcision or one not being circumcised? And we want to be a dose here and be smart in our answer. So, what do we think about biblically when the word uncircumcised is used? <laughs> I, I, I gave you some. There you go, Sheila. Thank you. I know I got some Bible readers on this page. Unclean. That's right, Sheila. Whenever the Bible uses the word uncircumcised, it's a lot of noise on this conference call. Somebody's doing something. Whenever the Bible uses the word, yes, Jackie. Yes, Jackie. That's right. Uncircumcision. It's always going to paint the image of someone unclean, unholy, defiled. Non-Hebrew could be if the conversation was only between Jew and Gentile. But we're talking about the image it paints. Maybe I'm not making the question clear. We want to look at the word that Paul is using that paints a picture for us. So we have Sheila and Jackie uh, and Tamika all stating unclean and not clean. Mary in unclean. Absolutely. That's the that's the image that the word uncircumcised paints. And vice versa with the so-called circumcised. The circumcised paints the image of one who is what? It's just the opposite. One who is clean. So those are the first two pictures of images that Paul throws out at us in the in the reading. You who were far off were called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcised. You were called unclean by the so-called those who were clean. So those are the first two pictures that Paul paints right off the bat. And then he says, uh, performed in the flesh by human hands. When you think about something done by human hands, you think about a work of man, an accomplishment. You might say, oh, he made that with his hands. Automatically, whatever it is you're thinking about, you don't believe in a, you don't think about a machine, you don't think about uh, miracles, you think about something that a man was able to do with his own grit, with his own might. So Paul paints the imagery of human accomplishment, a human creation, a work, a, a deed done by human. 
and then, then you have abolished or afar off. Afar off is good. That's another image that Paul uses in there. So he uses aliens. He uses circumcision, uncircumcised, aliens, strangers, uh, afar off. But he also uses um, 13 says, but now you were afar off, have been brought to Christ. But then again, verse number 14. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. King James says something different. King James says he uses partition and wall where barrier and wall is. So he uses he paints the image of a barrier or a wall or a partition. So when you think about those words, barrier, walls, partitions, with that image projected into your mind, what do you automatically see? If you're talking about a wall or a barrier or a partition, what do you see? What'd you say, Ben? Something in between. Is that what you said? Something in between. A border, something that, uh, uh, something that blocks barrier, like the orange traffic barriers to say you can't cross here or you can't come on this side. Absolutely, and that's and that's good, Jackie, because when we're thinking about barrier, when we're thinking about partition, when we're thinking about wall, we're thinking about something that stands in between something that obstructs a uh, crossing over or a looking over or a being over. He, he said that Christ came a division. There's something that divides. There's something that divides. Let's go back to that word that you used earlier, aliens. In the Bible, when the Paul uses this word aliens, Paul is talking about not of the same making one who is shut out from fellowship or other world like uninvited so when paul calls the gentiles they were aliens he's telling them that they were shut out from fellowship that they were not of the same making even though were they of the same human making and they were uninvited then when he comes back and uses the word a stranger He's talking about unheard of or a foreigner, someone not necessarily in touch with the other. Absolutely, Mary, something between us, division. Yes, orange barrels, yes, the separating, yes, a breakthrough. Yes, Jesus Christ is the breakthrough. So when Paul is using these images, the wall represents something which separates. And this is what you have to catch about these biblical phrases, even though they paint a picture. You want to kind of know what the author is intending to say. Because if he says wall and partition in the same conversation, you would think they were the same. But maybe he's using them to create a clearer or bring more clarity to what he's trying to drive home. So he uses both words in the same sentence. So when he uses the word wall, Paul is talking about that which separates in the same house. Now, what do you mean by in the same house? The Jew and the Gentile were not in the same house as much as they both came from Abraham. <laughs> you got to keep up. Because Ishmael and the 12 tribes came from Abraham being blocked. Yes. So when we think about the word wall in this particular text, he's talking about that which separates even of the same house. So even a little bit more closer to understanding could be in the idea of humanity. There 
both made out of the same thing. They both have the same amount of bones, same amount of teeth, two eyes, two ears, one nose, one mouth. All of those things there are alike, yet there is something that divides them, even in all of their humanity that's equal. That's why the idea is in the same house. Both coming from the house of Abraham, the good and the bad. But at the same time, there's a wall. Then he comes back and says, partition. Partition now becomes the fence or the hedge. When you think about the fence or the hedge, its entire purpose is to block, is to keep anybody from, is to obstruct. You put up fences, you put up hedges. Uh, remember the Bible said in Job chapter 1 when Satan was in a conversation with God, and he said, the only reason that Job is good is because you have put a hedge around him. The only reason Job works with you is because you have fenced him in. In other words, you've made it so I can't get to him. Now, remember that in Job chapter 1, right? So when Paul uses the word here, you have to keep that in mind. And I, and I told you, those who've been with me for a long time, I always tell you that, uh, well, I don't want to go into all that, but a lot of times in the Bible, one word, when it's found in the New Testament or Old, if you research that word, it will have a lot of its initial use intended, even in the context, wherever it is. Sometimes the word is first used in Genesis, might be first used in Exodus, and you might see a word that moves over into the New Testament. It's whatever it meant in Genesis or Exodus is going to have some of that same essence or some of the same founding ground of intent, even in the New Testament. So just like Satan uses the word uh, hedge or fenced in for Job, that's what Paul is using here. So when he uses the word partition, it interprets fenced or hedge. So the Gentiles have been fenced out or hedged out. They've been made to be outside. Yes, we see fellow citizens later on too, uh, Sister Mary. So we're going to definitely deal, deal with that. That's right, and being blocked. I want this class to take time because I want you to see the magnificent power of the cross and what God did to all of these things that were happening as God was moving the seed from eternity to pass. So he's bringing Christ through from the eternal world, through the past into the chronological world. And we want to see what Christ did that caused all of these things to be. That's what us all Paul is spending time with in chapters one, two, and three of Ephesians. He is showing them how they all came into the gospel and how now in the gospel they all are one. Chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three, all Paul is doing is helping them see their oneness. But he got to identify their differences in order to bring them back together and show them their oneness. So, and then somebody up there did say, Dwayne, when you did say the marriage, almost, but you and I are not married. We're not married to Jews. We're not married to the Gentiles. Our marriage is to Christ. But what he's talking about in the two and one, he's taking two separate people and he's made them one per people, two separate people, and made them one people. So when you think about that in imagery, you think about two objects coming together, making one. I almost can think about something like mercury, how you can have two beads of mercury, but if they get together, you no longer see any difference from the one from the, I don't care how big one was, and how small one, when they come together, all you're going to see is one Mercury. Not symbolizing marriage right here. Not right here, because he's talking about how he made the Jews and the Gentiles one. 
So right here, the Jews and the Gentiles are not married. They are adopted, remember? So the Jews and the Gentiles, if they're not married, then they are what? What are they? Huh? No, not not marriage. It's not marriage. Look at the text. For he, verse 14, himself is our peace, who made both groups into one. That's not symbolizing marriage there. I just put it on the screen for you. He's taken two separate people from two separate households and made them brothers and sisters. That's where we get the word in the, in the New Testament, brethren. Exactly, Tamika. He made them one family. You had a Jewish family. You had a Gentile, Gentilian family. And what God has done, what Jesus has done through the cross, is made those two into one family. No longer, remember Galatians, where there's neither Jew or Greek, Gentile, I mean Gentile or Greek, male or female, but they all are one in Christ Jesus. Who? Those who have been baptized into Jesus Christ. Yes, he's given them the same faith. Yes, he's made them one. So it's not talking about marriage at this particular place. He's talking about the adoption process of where now these two separate houses, uh, two separate people, the free woman and the bond woman, he's taken both of them and freed them in the blood of Christ and made them all children of God. They were called the children of Israel in the Old Testament. <laughs> But they were most often referred to as the people of God. Children of Israel, people of God. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us we've all been made the children of God. Romans chapter 7, or chapter 8, I'm sorry. Where we all cry out, our spirit bears witness with his spirit, that we all cry out, Abba, Father, brethren. The word brethren, as when you get down to the understanding of what the word brethren means, it means we came forth by one canal. This is an adult conversation with no kids on here. By one canal, we all came into the Lord through one womb. We all came in through one womb. That's what the word brethren means. One womb brought us all into the Lord. So we're not married to one another, but we are joined one to another by the blood of Christ, making us no longer two households, but one household. So yes, one family, one same faith. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it means. And that's what Christ is doing. It's not for you because other people probably have the same idea. So trust me, don't hesitate to print your question or your thought because all we can do is get clarity. We want this to be as lucid as possible. Even my conference call people, if you have something you want to add or, or ask, don't hesitate because it's, it's not my class, it's our class. And we want to make sure we all get to the same place at the same time. And so since we've already defined them, we've already kind of answered the part two of question one. What are they intended to communicate? If you brought all of these images together, and, and I think Ben, Tamika, Lee, uh, have stated them last. If we put all of this imagery together, because Paul just doesn't want them to hear him, Paul wants them to see him. That's the whole point of imagery. Imagery helps make it plain. Imagery helps paint a picture for you that which we all could 
see the same thing, even if we all don't hear the same thing. We all didn't hear the same thing. But then he said, beware of the dogs. We don't, we, have a diff, we all can have a different idea of what he meant, but trust and believe we all saw a dog. And if he said, beware, I, I don't think any of us saw French poodles. <laughs> I don't think any of us saw those little chicken, the little bitty puff dog. He said, beware of the dogs. And I think all of us can have the same image of some type of dog growling or ferocious. So he, he gives us a word with imagery so that no matter what we hear, we all can see the same thing. Y'all all right this evening? So he uses imagery. So even if we have trouble hearing the same thing, we all see the same thing. Beware of the dogs. Jesus says, oh, woe unto you, you snakes, you vipers. I don't think when they say, when he says woe unto you and we're looking at the attack they're raging on Jesus, I don't think we all see the little bitty brown garden snake in our grass that we can pick up. Be, beware, you vipers, you serpents. We see something that's poisonous or dangerous to the life. Something that's attempting to take life. So we see a cobra, we see a rattler, we see a boar, we see a black moccasin, a black mamba. It doesn't matter, but the snake or the serpent we see is one capable of taking life or being sneaky or conniving. So imagery in the Bible is very clear. And what we have to do is read for clarity not reading, projecting our own ideas into the scripture. Just take our time. And that's why I said I want to take my time tonight. Take your time and go back through and read it word by word. Yes, Tamika, and we know they will attack. Beware of the dog. Beware of the snakes. You know that they are able to take life. They are aggressively at you. That's why he says beware. They're trying to take you or take something from you. So when we're reading, don't jump words. Don't read a scripture like you already know what that says. Read it. And know what's happening in the scripture. Look at what he says. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly afar off. So we know whoever that was, uh, Brother Croy says, at a great distance and they could not cover the gap. They could see something, but they could not make up the gap. That's what we see when we think of you who were afar off. We think about somebody that's out of touch, out of reach, probably can't even be seen, but they're way over there. We see that. But then he says, have been brought near. Now what do we see? Whatever was out there that we were scratching to see, whatever we needed binoculars to see, now we see them full force, face up. Because that's the imagery that Paul is projecting. So no matter what we're trying to think, he wants us to use all the senses of our cognitive ability to get what he is saying because God wants us to have it. And why this lesson is so critical will be determined in just a few minutes. It's going to be very critical why this imagery is used then and why it's pertinent or relevant to us today in 2021. And so somebody said earlier back, I think it was Tamika, somebody, I think a couple people said it, but it was said that he says, what are these images intended to communicate? That the separation that once was is now ended. You were circumcised. You were unclean. You thought you were clean. But now in Christ Jesus, you both have been made clean by the blood. Whatever separation that once was is now over. 
you who were far off and you who thought you were close have now been brought into the very presence of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. The separation that once was is now over. Now, here's the most critical part. Not only, now the separation didn't happen so much with them, here it is, as much as it happened in Christ toward God. Let me say it again. <clears throat> he didn't take the Gentile and make him a Jew. He didn't take the Jew and make him a Gentile. But both as they stand, Gentile and Jew, putting them both inside of him, he brought forth, the Bible says, one new man. Why? Because this new man is not Jew or Gentile. He's a spiritual entity created and founded in Christ Jesus for the whole purpose of being brought to God. Oh, yes. First Corinthians, what's that? Five, I mean, uh, uh, 517. Oh, yeah, it's 1 Corinthians 5.17. I think that's 5.17, right? No, it can't be 5.17. It's not even 1 Corinthians. I think it's, uh, let me see here. Second Corinthians 5.17. That's what you was trying to get to? 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it said, no, that's okay. We, we, we're working together. Ain't nothing. Second uh, Corinthians. Paul states the same thing. He said to the church of Corinth, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have come. Or new things have come. Now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's something you ought to spend some time with right there. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Two things about that verse, even being applicable to the Ephesian letter we're in, because in our Ephesian letter, when Paul says again that for he himself is our peace, that's in verse 14, and then in verse 16 he says, I mean verse 15 he says, making the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Now, what I want you to do with that word peace in all of this context of scripture, specifically here, is remember what I shared with you about uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, we talked about blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God or the sons of God is what it says. But I think modern translations are going to say there's something a little bit different. Verse 9 of Matthew 5 says, hey, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the sons of God. But now when you look at peace, and you look at how peace is being used here, it's not the peace that some Christians would love to practice or believe to be. See, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall indeed be called the sons of God. That's who oh, I could preach this one Sunday. Watch this. If the Son of God here is the peace of all humanity and he reconciles the war or the conflict between us and God, then Jesus Christ says, and blessed are all of the other peacemakers, for they also shall be called the sons of God. They Just like me, the Son, came here to make peace, not with humanity, between God and man. 
So when we're called to be peacemakers, we're not running around shaking hands, hugging, kissing babies, telling everybody it's okay. It's all right if you just, as long as you just love God with all your heart. I just try to live peace. I don't want to start no arguments. That's not the blessed peacemaker that Christ is talking about. He's talking about those who are concerned about his children finding a way to bring others who are at difference with God, bringing them into the peace of God through the preaching of the gospel. That's what he's talking. That's what he means by blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I ain't got time to tell you nothing about little gods because that's going to just be too much for you tonight. But we are in the image of Jesus Christ and we are expected to bring peace and reconcile human beings to God because the ministry of reconciliation is ours. We, as the body of Christ, just I want you, I want you to look at his imagery for you. If all you can see is my head, but you know I have a body up under me, then you expect whenever you see my body, you know what the head is doing. Oh, this, this, this showing up his sermon talk right here. If you see the head and you know what the head is, for certain you know the body is in conjunction and in uh, continuity with the head. So if we are the body of Christ on earth, we ought to be moving and looking just like the head did when the head was on earth. That's what makes us peacemakers. Greater things than these shall they do if you believe in me. That's what he said in John chapter 14, verse 12 or verse 12 and 14 through 14. These things that you see in me do, greater things shall you do. Why? Because we're going to have opportunity to spread. Jesus spread the gospel for three years. And was limited to a particular area for a particular time, our time, and not just yours and mine, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. No, the work of the church will do greater works than Christ. Why? Because we are bringing thousands, millions. Y'all ain't even acting like y'all happy. It's time like too much work, right? That's what he expects of us. Let's get back to this lesson. Because we have to wait for Sunday for another sermon. God give me crunk on this thing. Look here. What they are intended to communicate is the separation that once was is no more. Whatever separation, those who were far off, you've been brought near. When you had two different groups and there was a wall separating you, there was a fence, there was a hedge that was prohibiting you and, and, and obstructing you, has been removed. Where the law was what separated you because for the, that is for the Jew. The abolishing and express the enmity, which is the law of commandment. You know the law was killing. You can't keep up with it. That's what he told us the Roman church. But Jesus Christ took that away from you. Imagery. That's right, sister. That's right, sister Calvin. Imagery. He's trying to show us something here. And so when the, the book author asked on, on question one on page 20, what are the imageries intended to communicate? Everything that's separated, all the separation that once was is no longer. Whatever it was that divided is no longer. So that in himself he might take two and make them into one household. And I tell you, there was two households. Because you had the, you had Ishmael, then you not, not only did Abraham have it with Ishmael and Isaac, then you had Esau and Jacob. It, it, it kept going. Two households coming out of one home. What God has done through Jesus Christ is he's taken all, both of these households and he's put them back in one home under one roof 
and that roof is the blood of Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus Christ did at the cross when he got, when he resurrected, he brought these two separate households together. That's what the imagery is meant to communicate. All of the separation that was factual, that was truth, that was present. It was, yes, you were far off. Yes, you were considered the unclean. Yes, you were two separate people. Yes, you were being hung by the law because the law could not make you righteousness. That's what the Galatian letter says. The law could not make you righteous. So yes, the law was in your way of reaching God because you're going to keep coming up short. But he said he moved it out the way. So establishing peace. Right? Is that in our Bibles? Making the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm going to keep driving that home because I'm not trying to create a... Uh, well, I am. I, I want the church to be more aggressive. I want the church to be more aggressive. Jesus Christ said to that man that day, Simon the Peter, upon that noble confession, Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I've shared with you a thousand times. You've been up under my teaching for any time. He, the church is offensive. She's on the move. I shared before. She doesn't stand back and take blows. She deliver blows. But if she receives any blows, she has an answer because she has a buffet with God, the Holy Spirit. But she's on the move. She's on the attack. She's making peace. She's out marching. She's out singing praises. She's out sharing God's kingdom. She's out expressing the love of God. She's out forgiving. She's out showing mercy. She's doing, this is the church movement. That's what it's all about. And it says, and you might reconcile them both in one body. That's powerful. I don't want you to miss that. And he might reconcile them both. Well, you know what that does for the modern day evangelical teachers and preachers? And a lot of people that you might hear everywhere else, you need to put this in your arsenal of notes. Listen to it again. Verse 16. And he might reconcile them both both in one body to God through the cross. In the text, he's talking about Gentiles and Jews. Spiritual warfare is a daily war. But spiritual warfare is the fight we fight sometimes within and without. The church is not so much about spiritual warfare as much as she is about spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel is spiritual warfare, what some people don't know. Spiritual warfare is not always warding off and fending off. Spiritual warfare is the all-out onslaught attack against everything that's against God, not to strike it down, but to build it up just like Christ did into God. We're not going out to fight people. We're not going out to fight issues. We're going out to reconcile. Oh, the church is too silent on this. And the church is too silent on that. The church business is to save souls. Bring people to God. Bring people to God. Bring people to God. And all those inside the house of God doing our best with one another to make sure we all stay safe and make it home. Not safe, locked in, cooped up, not doing anything, but to watch each other, keep each other, pray for each other, love each other, forgive each other. And 
And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. The point I was making when I was into these two verses here, I'm starting in verse 16 and 17. The point I was making is the Gentile and the Jew needed reconciling. Some people will try to preach you and teach you that the Jew has always been saved. That's not true. The Jew had to be reconciled and brought near by the work that Christ did on the cross. Were the Jewish special people to God? Absolutely. Never changed. Still biblical today. Yes, they were a special people to God. Yes, they did a special, had a special place in the historical working of God to bring forth the, the seed and the, the blessing, the miraculous hand of God. Yes, all that's true. Were they, are they a chosen people? The word of God stands sure. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean they didn't need to be saved. See? Paul makes it clear that those were that were far off needed to be reconciled and taught the message of peace just as much as those who were near, who were near, the Jews. They needed to be taught and preached the message of reconciliation and peace. For through him, verse 18, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. He needed the Jews and the Gentiles to tell them that none of you are strangers or foreigners, but all of you are fellow citizens that come to God through one spirit. And you all are of God's household. We got to get out of here, 753. I hope some of this conversation has did something with you. And if nothing else, go back and take your time and just read through all of chapter two. Read, read through it over and over again. Let it sink in. And if you're bold enough, go ahead and read chapter three as well. Read chapter two. Read chapter two. Slowly. I would, I would encourage you and invite you to read it in multiple translations. It put everybody, absolutely, sister, more than a level playing field. It put everybody on the same, at the same table. Absolutely. Put everybody at the same table. Remember Mephibosheth, right? How many of y'all remember Mephibosheth? Down in Lodabar. <laughs> How many of y'all, come on, I need to see some Bible readers. Mephibosheth, Lodabar. How many, how many Bible readers are familiar with that story? Mephibosheth, Lodabar. Anybody on conference call? Okay. I, I don't see no responses up there. I just want to get the right spelling before I put it up there. Yes, here it is. Ma. His sacrifice sufficient to make us spiritually alive and holy in his sight. All of us, the Jew and the Gentile, we needed what Christ did I put it on I put it on there for y'all to go back and look at it. this is this is a reply to my sister saying they put everybody on the level playing field. absolutely. 
sure did. But what he really did was brought us all to the same table. And it don't matter if you were a whole Jew or a crippled Gentile. When you sit at the master's table, we all the same height. We all going to eat the same thing on the master's table. Always remembering it ain't your table. It ain't my table. It's the king's table. We have been invited to the king's table. Even if you cripple, and when he sits you at his table, you don't even get to see your crippleness no more. <laughs> now, everything is said before you. So, yes, he leveled the playing field, but he made us all able to sit at the table of the master, at the table of the king. Jonathan's son. Jonathan's son. Absolutely. King Saul's. Uh-uh, you got you got you got it. Uh -uh, sister Duane, I love you, but I ain't gonna do that. My sister said, What text? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna give it to you, sister. I ain't gonna be mean. I ain't gonna be mean to you. Second Samuel, we got to get out of here. It's after it's it's, oh no, it's almost eight o'clock. So anyway, uh, I, I put it up there for you, Dwayne. I got you. I ain't gonna be mean. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna show you some love tonight, cause you probably was the only one big enough to ask. Everybody else, everybody else wanted to know. Hey guys, it's been great. You know I enjoy you all the time. Uh, I, I, I enjoy you immensely. Love talking about the word of God. Love seeing the people of God. Love being in the company of God. God bless you all. Uh, y'all know this Saturday. Uh, and make, make sure um, Ed uh, comes within his time frame for his second shot. His time frame, not early. His time frame. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Good study because y'all make it a good study. So I appreciate you. Um, so everybody making sure they uh, Okay. I, I knew what you meant, and when you said Tavy, I knew what you meant. That's why I ain't bother you. I, I know exactly what you meant. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, mercy, kindness, and goodness. Be with us all as we make our way to our place, uh, as we make our way through the evening. Guide us, protect us, and keep us. Uh, give a traveling grace of protection. Uh, to my brother's sister, she's traveling the highways and byways. May she arrive safe without her harm and danger. Ben and his whole entire household, him and himself, Sister Rosie and Cotton, uh, my family, uh, the whole entire Garfield Heights Church of Christ, Sister Yvonne. Uh, we want to ask continued prayer for her and Sister Daisy as well. Lord God, we love you. We know that you love us, and we just... We're just praying, oh, Father, that we continue to do those things that be pleasing and stuff on your sight. Have mercy upon us. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Don't forget Powder Room tomorrow, ladies' night. Yes, yes, Maya. Thank you so much, sister. We've got to keep Sister Sherry Bostic in our prayer. Uh, with, uh, with me and my wife, we love we love working with Sherry. We, we did some great work when we were together for that brief period of time out there. So, uh, good system. We ask God to keep strengthening her and holding her up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, uh, Sister Mary.
So, so, and don't forget the second shot this Saturday. The second shot this Saturday. And if you know anybody 18 and older that wants to receive this vaccination, they have got to register. It'll be up soon, but the 24th, we'll be doing another, uh, starting another series at our church building. Be looking for that information coming soon. On the 24th, more information will be up. But this Saturday, those who had the first shot, second shot at Garfield High Civic Center. Do not forget Powder Room tomorrow night. Uh, God bless you. We love you all. We thank you all for all of your feedback and all of your sharing. God bless you, and you have a wonderful evening.